This is Real Estate Rookie episode 284. I really focused in on not just one city, but I was looking at specific zip codes within that city. And within those zip codes, I knew the street boundaries that I wanted to stay within to make sure I was super laser focused on one little niche. And that allowed me to get much, much better, much faster, and much more accurate at analyzing deals in those markets. Because instead of looking at this big, large set of potential properties, it was this kind of smaller micro set that was easier to, to digest. My name is Ashley Kerr, and I'm here with my co-host, Tony Robinson. And welcome to the Real Estate Rookie Podcast, where every week, twice a week, we bring you the inspiration, motivation, and stories you need to hear to kickstart your investing journey. And I love the Rookie Replies because uh, it takes a... Obviously, we've got amazing guests on all the other episodes, but it's cool to kind of hear what our audience, what our Rookie audience is thinking about and what's uh, what's kind of stopping them from getting started or, or keeping going and being able to dive into those questions head on. Yeah. So today's question, um, we talk about a lot of different things uh, for our rookie replies. And if you guys want to have your question submitted on here, you can always leave us a voicemail at one eight 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 five rookie You can write your question in the Real Estate Rookie Facebook group or you can, you know, send myself or Tony a DM at Wealth From Rentals or at Tony J Robinson on Instagram, and we may play your question on the show. So the first thing we're gonna do today, uh, the question is kind of our first deal diary, as Tony had called it. We <laughs> break down the the first deals that we ever did. We talk about partnerships, um, and then we also talk about closing off market versus on market deals. What's the different paperwork you have to do? How do the processes vary? Yeah. And then our, our last one here is actually about short-term rentals, my bread and butter, and uh, the liability that comes along with that and and how to kind of protect yourself and, and get things set up the right way. So lots of good questions. Um, before we, we kind of keep rolling here, I just want to give a quick shout out to someone by the username of Mrs. Placid Chaos. I'd love to say five-star review. And the review says, real estate is something I've wanted to invest in for several years now, but I've been intimidated by the thought that I couldn't financially make it happen. But this podcast has shown me so many different avenues that can be taken taken and I'm confident I'll have my first property before the end of the year. Um, we are confident that you will as well, Mrs. Plastic Chaos. And if you're listening to the Rookie Show and you're, you're part of the Rookie community and you haven't yet left us an honest rating review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, please do. The more views we get, the more folks we can reach. And the more folks we can reach, the more folks we can help. And with that, let's jump in to our Rookie Reply Questions. All right. So jumping into our first question, this one comes from Sean Gallagher. And Sean's question is, I'm new to investing and was wondering what your first deal was. If you don't mind, also tell me, how did you analyze the deal to determine if it's good or not? So first deal diaries is what we're doing uh, on this question, Ash. So uh, why don't you go first? Give us the, the details of that first deal. Yeah. My first deal was the first property I ever looked at <laughs> when I decided I want to be a real estate investor. There was one property that I saw on the MLS first. And so I contacted the agent that had listed it and set up a time to go see it. And she said, I just want you to know there are, are a lot of foundation issues and flooding that has happened on this property. And that's why it's been sitting on the market. And so that right there gave me cold feet. And I was like, you know what? Never mind. I don't want to see it. So then that's when I actually contacted uh, my parents friend who was a real estate agent and said, you know, I, this is what I want to do. And so I found a duplex in a market that I knew because I was already a property manager there and went and looked at it. I called uh, the person who had already agreed to be my money partner. They wanted to start investing in real estate too, but didn't have the time, didn't have any knowledge about it. So we both went together to look at the property. I ran the numbers. And when I say I ran the numbers, it was a pencil and a piece of paper and me being like, okay, I know I can rent each apartment for $700 per month. Uh, my water bill is going to be this because I contacted the village to, to ask approximately what the water bill would be. I got some of the utility cost from um, the seller. I had my agent ask for that. And then I tried to think of any other expense, property taxes, insurance. And I was like, okay, this will work. My um, payment uh, was going to be to my actual partner. He was going to pay cash for the property and then he would receive a mortgage payment from our LLC. So we were paying him directly and we weren't paying a bank, 
which, um, and then he got 50% of the cash flow. So five and a half percent on the capital he put into the property. And he was getting it fully paid back, amortized over 15 years, plus the five and a half percent, 50% of the cash flow. He was actually making out pretty good. Yeah, it's a good deal. Like, I would never do that deal now, but it got me started. And like, yeah. He put a lot of trust in me, took his life savings and dumped it into that property. So we created an LLC together. Once we got that property under contract, we started an LLC where we were 50-50 on the LLC. And then, um, yeah, we went to close on the property. I put in a little money for the rehab. It needed a split unit for AC and heat in the upstairs. So I ended up paying out of pocket for that. And then I think maybe the flooring I paid for. And then we had a couple other, um, we put new cabinets in, things like that, where he put in the money for that. And then we just, that was just money put into the deal that we didn't actually, you know, pay ourselves back for. Um, we eventually sold the house and made a good profit on it. Um, the property did cash flow. I did make one mistake on that property, and that was I did not account for snow plowing. So this property was outside of Buffalo, New York, and uh, snow plowing is definitely something you need to pay for, or even if you have a tenant do it. Uh, so I ended up, I think, discounting the lower uh, tenant's rent. I can't even remember the amount, but they were in charge of shoveling the driveway since the driveway was used by uh, both tenants of the, the duplex. So um, that definitely hurt the cash flow a little bit. It definitely wasn't a, a deal breaker, but... Um, yeah. So that was my first deal. It was definitely not my best deal. But after I got that first one, uh, we closed on our second one, I think maybe three months later. And it was just like from there, just like it's Snowballs. really that propeller. Yeah. What, uh, do you remember, when did you close on that first deal? Ashley, what, what month, what year? It was September, 2014, 2014, man. I didn't know it was in 2014. I didn't realize that. Yeah. And that's awesome. Um, and then do you remember what the cash flow numbers were on that deal? Like how much were you making while you guys owned it? Oh God. Um, when we first started out, it was only like a couple hundred dollars we, we were getting in cash flow, um, because we were basically, you know, leveraging the whole thing. You know, we paid, I think 72,000 for it. And the mortgage was for 72,000 because we were paying, you know, my other partner back. So it was 100% leverage by him. Like I would never do that with a bank or whatever, but, um, it was very minimal cash flow. And then, um, we did the rehab in the upstairs. And then over the years we were able to increase the rents. Um, we didn't have a ton of capital expenditures on that property at all, but the lifetime we, we held it, we actually sold it in 2020, I think is when we sold it and we ended up selling it for, 130,000, I think. It's pretty good. Yeah. So yeah. that that property was definitely a great play for appreciation. Did you ever refi or did you keep it with that debt to the partner? So after we bought that property in February 2015, we bought our second property and uh that one we used his cash again to purchase. And then when we bought our third property, we went and did a portfolio loan putting those two properties under one mortgage. And we use that debt then to go and buy our third property. So we had a mortgage on them, but we were still paying um, the partner. And it was just kind of, we just kept rolling over like that, like the mortgage on property C that ended up paying for the property D, you know, and it just mm -hmm. kind of went through the line. And that's how we uh, had acquired our units at that time. Yeah. So you're almost like, I mean, you were burring basically, right? Yeah. Where you're paying like the true burr where you're paying cash for it up front and then refinancing and using that capital to. Yeah. So basically we're just reusing and over that same capital. We just kept reusing over and over again. And so we've actually kept that loan going. And so throughout the years, as you know, the cash flow has done well in the properties, my partner would go to Vegas or different things like that. And, you know, he would take some of that cash flow out because we've always just kind of held it in there. Or it would be, you know, he wanted to to buy something expensive or whatever. And, you know, I would pay part of his um, mortgage off. Like, say, here's 20,000. We're just going to take it off the mortgage over for you. And I looked the other day and there's less than a year left on that mortgage because we've just kind of accelerated the mortgage pay down on that. And he is so bummed 
that he's not going to be getting that mortgage <laughs> he's like, payment he's like, slow down, slow down. Slow but down. I'm like, you do understand. You're so you're going to be end up getting more cash flow now because we don't have your mortgage payment. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, it sounds like a like a solid first deal. Um, my my first deal was back in October 2019, um, and it was a single family house in Shreveport, Louisiana. Not Freeport, not Shreveport, <laughs> but Shreveport. I'll still never remember. You, you'll never remember. Um, <laughs> I actually broke down the numbers in, in pretty excruciating detail back in episode 10 of the Rookie Podcast when I was on as a guest. Um, but I'll, I'll give you like the, the Cliff Notes version here. So essentially, I found a bank in Shreveport that, um, that had a really cool loan product where if you found a property where the purchase price and the rehab costs were no more than like, I think it was like 72 and a half percent of the after repair value. They would fund the entire purchase and the rehab with um, a year long note, uh, interest only, and then they would do the back end refinance to put you on permanent debt. Um, so I did that. I found a property. It was on the MLS, uh, listed for $100,000. I, I locked it up, got it under contract, we closed on it. Spent another sixty or so thousand dollars to to renovate the property, and then we uh, refied it out at a price for two hundred and thirty thousand dollars. So I was like, just was under that seventy two and a half percent on the refi, and uh, I was basically into that deal for literally zero dollars um, out of pocket, and it was pretty pretty cool. Um, and then we, uh, we, I, I found a property manager out there. I, I lived in California. The property was in Louisiana. So I found a property manager, um, that got it leased up for me. I don't remember what we were renting it for anymore. We, I had the property for like a year and I ended up selling it. Um, but I want to say I, the cash flow was pretty minimal. It was like 150 bucks a month. I think I was making after accounting for like property management, and some of the other fees. But, um, again, it was, $150 on $0 invested. So even though the actual dollar amount wasn't all that high, it was an infinite return because I put no money into the deal. And I did that same deal with that bank um, on two properties there in Louisiana. And tell us the rest of the story on that first one. So what happened with it? Yeah. I mean, so that that first deal actually turned out really well. It was the second deal in Shreveport where we had the um, the flood. We have many, many episodes talking <laughs> yeah. about that second yeah, property. That, that second but property. for the first one, what happened? Yeah. I mean, so I, I held the property for a year. We had one tenant in there the whole time. Um, There's a military base in, in that city and it was a military family that was there on assignment. Um, They ended up getting orders to deploy somewhere else. Um, so they gave us notice. And after that year, we'd already transitioned into the short-term rentals. I was like, ah, I think I'm just going to take my money and and uh, and sell the property. So we ended up selling it. I think for it wasn't 230, even though it appraised for that much. I think we sold it for like 215 or something like that. But I still got a check when I sold it, plus all the cash flow, plus the tax benefits. So it was honestly a really good, like, you know, I got on base with that first uh, first property and it was a really good proof of concept for me that I could actually buy real estate and collect money. <laughs> <laughs> so if you are doing that same thing and say you're starting over, but in today's market, do you think you'd be able to find that same loan product and kind of make that same deal work? You know, I don't know um, because I actually contacted that bank um, I can't, I, it was, wasn't even to like ask them about the loan product. Like, I think I needed like some paperwork or something for like my taxes. And I was just like chatting with the, the person at the bank and, and they're like, Oh, you know, actually since COVID we stopped doing that, that type of loan product. Um, so I don't even know if they offered that anymore, but if they did, I would 100% go after that deal. Um, because it's such a low risk way to get into it. And what was really cool was that, uh, the bank, they they funded the entire purchase, but they also funded the rehab, but they funded the rehab in, in draws. So it was like four different draws that they allowed uh, for the contractor to take. And the way that it would work is they did they did like a, an appraisal before, then they looked at the the bid that the, that the contractor gave me and said, okay, based on the current condition of the property, and if you combine this with the bid that the contractor gave you, here's what we think the property will be worth after you're done. So they almost validated my ARV for me. And then during the construction process, before they would release a draw, they would send an inspector out to the job site to confirm that the work that the contractor said he was doing was actually done. So it was like this second layer of like, 
it was almost like training wheels for my first deal because I had this bank who had a vested interest in making sure that the project went well, who was, they were validating my numbers. They were inspecting the, the, the construction, the, the contractor's work. They were managing all the draw payments. They made it super, super easy for me. So if I could go back and do it again, I probably would. Yeah. One thing I did learn about that. I met with this hard money lender in Texas one time and just like he broke down everything about how, you know, hard money works and operates and all these different things. But they did the same thing where they would, you know, have somebody inspect the property and he kept like, you know, pushing it and selling it as like, this is a huge advantage to you. And it was, but the person that I was there with, he's like, Ashley, keep in mind, they're charging you for this service. They're charging you to send an inspector out. They're charging you all these fees for them to kind of oversee the project. They're charging you a fee for a draw. And I don't know if it was exactly the same for your bank, but that's definitely something to be cautious of. Like that shouldn't be the only reason you're going to that bank to do that, that hard money or to do that, that loan because of having that kind of resource as an advantage, you may be able to pay a contractor or a real estate agent or somebody else to kind of be that oversight for you too, where it may be, you know, cheaper, more affordable. That's a great point. And I think I was in a unique position because they were, they were just like a local credit union. So they weren't Mm -hmm. a hard money lender who needed to make their points on fees and all these other things. Like, you know, this is a person who's like nine to five employee, like they're just kind of grinding out at their job. And um, the inspections and everything didn't come with any additional costs because for them, they just wanted to make sure they were protecting the asset. So like, it was a fantastic way uh, for me to get started. And honestly, like I said, if I, if that loan product still exists, I might go back to that city to buy another one. It wouldn't be in a flood zone, but I might go back to that city just to kind of keep that, keep that ball rolling. So I think my advice for somebody listening that maybe can't do the deal that Tony just did because they can't find that loan product is to go back to episode 280, which would have been, I think, two weeks ago. Uh, We did a Pace Morby. We had him on for a rookie reply, and he breaks down creative financing, how to uh, do subject to and how to do seller financing. So I think that is a great alternative in today's market to be able to get some kind of um, zero money down deal by using those two strategies. Asha, we, we, we should also answer the second part of, the, of Sean's question is how did you analyze the deal to determine if it's good or not? Um, so I think Ash and I both have kind of similar um, well, maybe not for your first deal, Ash. I know maybe yours is a little bit different, but for for me, that that first deal, um, I was already well entrenched in like the the bigger pockets um, community as as just like a consumer. So I was already listening to the OG podcast. I I had read several of the bigger pockets books. I was a pro member with my my calculator. And I used the BP calculator to analyze every single property that I was looking at. And uh, I think this was before um, BP had the BP insights. So I was using um, tools like um, Rentometer. Um, I was looking on Craigslist and Facebook Marketplace to just try and analyze what the potential um, rental revenue would be. And I used those numbers to, to kind of plug them into the um, the BP calculator. And then I actually met with the local property manager, the one that I ended up hiring. And I had them give me numbers on potential expenses for a property of that size. And that gave me a lot of confidence. And I feel like what helped me a ton as well, Sean, was that I really focused in on not just one city, but I was looking at, at specific zip codes within that city. And within those zip codes, I knew kind of the the street boundaries that I wanted to stay within um, to, to kind of you know, make sure I was really just super laser focused on one little niche. And that allowed me to get much, much better, much faster and much more accurate at analyzing deals in those markets. Because instead of looking at this big, large set of potential properties, it was this kind of smaller micro set that was easier to to digest. Yeah, mine is different, actually. I didn't. So I bought that property the end of 2014. And I did not discover bigger pockets until 2017. So for me, my only knowledge of analyzing a deal was because I was managing a 40 unit apartment complex in that same town. I had also previously worked as an accountant. I was an an intern at an accounting firm all throughout college. I had graduated with an accounting and finance degree. And so I had a basic understanding or maybe more than basic understanding of financials, of the profit and loss statement, uh, how to calculate cash flow for any business. So 
I basically just took what I knew from accounting and I looked, okay, what's my income? What are my expenses? And then uh, to determine what my cash flow would actually be, it was, okay, what, what, what's going to be my principal mortgage payment? Any other loans I'm going to, to need to be paid back? Um, so that was kind of the only way I knew how to analyze. I also saw as the property manager of that 40 unit apartment complex, I saw other you know, expenses that may come up, um, you know, their, what the property taxes were like for that, that town, um, just different things. So basically experience, uh, from my accounting job and experience from being a property manager is I just kind of figured it out, um, how to analyze the deal. Obviously now I don't analyze deals that way. Like I realize there's a lot more that goes into it, but at that time I didn't know what, cash on cash return was. I didn't know what ROI was. I didn't know what price to rent ratio was. I was just, is this going to cash flow? That was basically it. That was my only metric, I guess, as to yeah. if the property would uh, be a good investment or not. But you got to start somewhere, right? And mm -hmm. that first deal is one that kind of got you going. And you know, obviously everyone listening to this podcast has the benefit of already being exposed to everything that BP has to offer. So leverage yeah. the podcast, leverage the, the calculators, leverage the community, leverage the books, leverage the YouTube channel. Um, and that's really going to give you kind of the, the confidence to, to move forward and, and analyze correctly. So Sean, hopefully that gets you started off on the right foot. Um, and um, yeah, man, we're, we're excited to hopefully see you get that first deal closed and uh, you either be a, a rookie rock star, maybe a guest on the, on the podcast one day. All right. So next question here. Um, Aaron J. Nygaard is the, uh, the person asking this question. Um, I've only heard the last name Nygaard one other time. Have you ever seen the show Fargo, Ashley? No, I haven't. I have at least heard of it. Um, I'm yeah. pretty sure that you and I have never, ever watched the same show or movie. <laughs> <laughs> Except for Tommy Boy, only because Except I made Tommy you. Except Tommy Boy, because you forced me. Um, <laughs> Fargo is, I think it was on like FX. I watched it on Hulu. You can watch the whole first season, um, but it, I'm not going to spill the beans, but it's like literally probably one of my, my most favorite shows that I've watched like oh, really? recently. Yeah. And the main character, his last name is, uh, his name is Lester Nygaard. Anyway, not what today's question is about, but Aaron Nygaard, he says, um, what paperwork do I need to close an off market deal and why? If they are cash offers, can it all be done between me and the seller? Do you typically ask for an inspection period? Any help with these questions would be great. Thanks. Um, so, Ash, I think we, we've both purchased properties, both on market and off market. Um, so, I, I guess, what, what paperwork do you typically kind of use to set up your deals when, when you're going off? And actually, I guess we should take a step back, right? And, and just like mm -hmm. define. Pace actually did this when we interviewed him on whatever episode that was. And I think it's maybe important for fo folks to understand like what the difference is between on market and off market. So, when you talk on market, those are properties that are typically listed by real estate agents that are on the MLS. So when you open up your phone on Zillow or Redfin or wherever, um, and you see all of those properties that are listed there, those are on market properties, the vast majority of which have been listed by real estate agents. Off market deals are properties that are not found on sites like Zillow, Redfin, et cetera, or are not listed on the MLS. And instead, there's some kind of direct connection between the buyer and the seller. It could be that she was a buyer. Maybe it's a neighbor of yours who's selling their property next door and the two of you are just having a conversation. Maybe you're using a, a third party like a wholesaler um, and the wholesaler is a person that's found the seller. Now they're connecting you, the buyer, with the seller. But typically it means that the properties are not listed publicly anywhere and there's no real estate agents involved typically. So that's the difference between on market and off market. And the challenge with off market is that because there is no real estate agent, there is no one there to really kind of guide um, the transaction to make sure that everything's done correctly. So that's the the challenge. So Ash, what is a, what is your experience typically on the off market stuff? Yeah. And I think it's also, we should discuss depending on what state you're in, there's different ways to close on a property too. So in New York state where I'm from, you have to have an attorney to close on a property in California where Tony is, you do not have to, you can go directly to the title company. So in New York state, the attorney is the facilitator between you and the title company, along with you and the seller's attorney. So for me, when I am purchasing an on-market deal, I have my uh, real estate agent drop the contract. If I am purchasing an off-market deal, 
I have my attorney, usually her assistant, draw up the contract. So she uses the same exact contract that a real estate agent would use and fills it in for me. So I just send an email with the information. So the property address, the seller's name, you know, what LLC I want to put the property in, um, the mailing address I'm going to use, uh, what it, my offer is, any terms on the property. And then, um, my attorney's assistant will go in and fill in all of that information, send it to me to look over. And then I usually docu sign it. And then that's when I can present it to the seller or send it over to the seller to sign from there. I give my attorney the executed documents, the signed documents. The seller gives their attorney those documents. We have also put on the the contract as to who our, each of our attorneys are. And then from there, the attorneys pretty much take over. They order the, the title work. They handle escrow. And they basically, you know, make sure each party is doing their part of, you know, it's do I need proof of funds? Do I need a commitment letter from the bank after a certain date? Um, and then they set up the closing date and, you know, do the the closing. So that's kind of the difference for me when doing on market is off market is I'm just using a different facilitator in a sense. And I'm really not, I'm still pretty hands off in each situation. The big difference I see is if I do an off market deal, um, is it just me, the, the negotiation with the seller and being able to talk to the seller directly. I actually think it's a huge advantage than having to tell my agent to tell their agent to tell the seller. And I feel like sometimes it's like playing telephone Mm -hmm. (laughs) as to doing that. But um, whether I'm doing on market or off market, usually after the real estate contract has attorney approval in either situation and is signed and both attorneys approve, any situations that may come up before the property actually closes, I have found that it's best to have my attor- my attorney negotiate with their attorney to kind of figure out a resolution for that um, instead of having my agent and their agent kind of figure something out or go back to the negotiation table or anything. So for example, if I have an inspection done, here are the things that I want fixed. I'll usually send it to my attorney to just say, you know, can we ask for five grand off because these are the things that result of the inspection, whatever, then they ask their attorney and things like that. So I do try to keep it to one person instead of having my attorney and my agent, um, you know, trying to figure things out throughout the closing process. Ash, what's a, what's like the typical cost, if you know, for your attorney, like what kind of fees they charge on like a usual transaction? Um, usually around like $1,200 is what I'm paying right now to, to close on a property. And that includes the, the title work. So I think my, and like the title insurance, uh, on that too. So I don't know exactly offhand. What is the actual attorney fee on it? Yeah, that's uh that's about what we pay our escrow company. So our process is super similar to you, but instead of using an attorney, uh, we have a really good relationship with like an escrow company that we like to use here in California. And whenever we have an off market deal, same, we just send them the details of the transaction, um, who the buyer is, if we're selling the property, or who the you know vice versa, just the details of both parties. They draft up all of the agreements, uh, the documents. Typically, it's the same what we would get from um, a, a licensed agent here in California as well, because California has like a like a California version of like a purchase and sale agreement. Um, and they, they draft it all up. They send out all the docu signs. They collect all the, the earnest money deposits. They're coordinating with title to get all the, the title work done and make sure everything's clean and clear there. Um, so they, they almost act as like a, almost like a transaction coordinator, but for me personally, um, for each deal that we do. So I would encourage anyone that's listening, uh, if you are doing an off market transaction, even if you're not using a real estate agent, still find that kind of qualified, uh, like a third party, whether it's a, a, an attorney, if you're in, in New York or an escrow company, like how we use or a title company, whatever it may be, find that that company to kind of help facilitate that transaction. And that's how you can make sure that you're, you're kind of checking all of the right boxes. One thing I do want to mention too, is as far as the process, um, if you're buying commercial property, you most likely won't use the contract that, you know, real estate agents use like the statewide um, contract that where real estate agents are just filling in the blanks. Usually in my situation, I use a, a commercial broker for commercial properties. And even though I'm using him, he doesn't 
usually put together the contract. He will, but I usually have my attorney create the contract because it's usually so specific as to like what's included, what's not included, um, and different things like that. So that's also something to be cautious of where usually on the commercial side, there's not just that general generic contract where you're just plug and play the information. Um, so keep that in mind too, if you're buying commercial property. Yeah. Super valid point. And there's just one other part of Aaron's question here. He says, do you typically ask for an inspection period? So Aaron, uh, I, I, I typically, all of the things that you would have in a regular real estate, uh, purchase and sell agreement, you should also include when you're going off market. So, um, and obviously it's really whatever you and the seller agree to, but yeah, you can include all of those same things. So if you need uh, an inspection contingency, if you want a financing contingency, whatever other things you want to include in that contract, you're more than welcome to. You aren't limited to doing that just because it's an off-market transaction. So even for us, if we're buying something off market, depending on who the seller is or kind of what the trend, what the situation is, uh, we typically still do include an inspection period uh, because we want to make sure that uh, we're protecting ourselves and, and buying this asset. We do have some wholesalers that we buy from um, where uh, the EMDs are non-refundable on day one. Uh, but in those situations, we still want to make sure that we get eyes on the property before we put that EMD up um, to make sure that we're not you know, walking into any unforeseen issues. But yes, you can totally and you should include an inspection period when you're going off market as well. Yeah. And for me, I haven't done an inspection in a long time, but I recently put an offer in on a property that um, I didn't get, unfortunately, but it was the first time I put an inspection in in a long time just because it was pretty, it was outdated, but it was very well taken care of. And it just didn't look like it needed extensive rehab where properties I've bought in the last couple of years have needed extensive rehab. And the market was just so competitive that I would skip the inspection on those because I knew that I was going to be redoing everything anyways. And it just kind of gave me a leg up. I feel like the market is shifting where you have that ability now to put that inspe inspection period back in and still be competitive in the market. Um, but also it, I think it very much varies on what kind of property you're going in and, and purchasing too. Um, when I flipped a house in Seattle, Washington, one thing I learned there is if there is something wrong with the sewer line that goes from the main to the house, for some reason, there is like, I can't remember exactly if it's a permit issue or if it's something, but it has something to do with the cost of repairing that septic. So if Tony sold me a house in Seattle and there ended up being something wrong with that sewer line, it would cost me a lot more to fix it than it would if Tony, as the current homeowner, went in to fix it. So I can't remember exactly what that detail is, but um, you guys can ask James Daner because he's the yeah. one that I learned it from. and <laughs> He'll be able to rattle it off the top of his head, the specifics. I wonder if it has something to do with like the, maybe like the assessed tax value of the property or something. Like, you know, when a property changes hands, they like reassess it and maybe that's how, yeah, I don't know. I'm, I'm shooting in the dark here. Well, this was, I pretty sure it was like the direct cost, like the cost to, so I don't know if it was like you had to get a more expensive permit or you actually had to get a permit where if you were the current owner and you had already owned the property for so long or something. I, I don't remember, but it's just like, those are little things you would never like think of. So every single property, he does a sewer scope. He scopes that line. And it, what he does is he'll just say, okay, like he'll negotiate with the seller. And maybe one option is, you know, it's going to cost five grand for this to be replaced. We will actually add five grand onto the purchase price if you go ahead and just do this repair before we close and pay for it, because it's going to cost us more. So it's worth it for us to just pay you to, to get it done. Cool. Well, let's move on to our next question here. This one comes from Michael Buffudo. And Michael's question is just went into contract on our first STR. Congratulations, Michael. But we went into it as a second home. Wondering if I should take out renter's insurance or regular homeowners. If I take out renter's insurance, will it mess up my mortgage? And if so, um, and I take out regular homeowners, does it cover renters in it anyways? Thanks, um, Michael. This is a this is a great question. So, um, renter's insurance is, and Ashley, you can probably speak to this better than I can. But if I'm understanding the question correctly, Michael. Renter's insurance is typically what you make your tenants take out when they move into your property, not necessarily what you as the owner would need to take out 
on behalf of your tenants. Like I know every apartment I've lived in, um, and even the the long term rentals that we did have, we had our tenants get their own renters insurance, which covered like the 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 goods of theirs that were inside of that property. Now, what we do for all of our short term rentals is we we notify uh, the insurance company that it is going to be used as a short-term rental. Even if you have a second home mortgage, you can still do that because the short-term rental or the second home loan still allows you to rent out that property when you're not using it for per- personal use. Um, so we still uh, let our insurance companies know that it's being used as a short-term rental. They add some additional coverage to make sure that it accounts for the increased risk that comes along with having short-term uh, rental occupancy. Uh, but in addition, In addition to that, what we also do is we got an additional umbrella policy to help with any potential liability um, that might come from that property. Um, So there there are two resources I'm going to give you, Michael, to help with the insurance piece. Um, One company is called Steadily. Uh, They're an insurance broker in the short-term rental space. And uh, we've we've heard really great reviews from folks in the space about being able to get uh, pretty competitive uh, short-term rental focused insurance policies through Steadily. Uh, and then another company is called Proper Insurance, and they specialize in short-term rental uh, home insurance. And they offer some additional things like um, uh, like revenue protection. So if you have an instance where your property goes down for some reason, they can recoup your revenue for you. But they also have like liability protection for uh, short-term rental host. So that's that's my initial take. Um, Ash, I don't know what are your, what are your thoughts for for Michael here? Yeah, you said it exactly. Like you'll have to get the homeowner's insurance because first of all, your mortgage is going to require it. If you don't have a mortgage on the property, you don't have to have insurance on it, I guess. Um, you can be self-insured. I have actually bought a couple duplexes where, you know, the owner is like, oh, I don't have insurance on it. I'm self-insured. <laughs> and so um, you do have that option. But if you do have a mortgage on the property, the lender is going to require you to show proof of the insurance and that it is paid every year. And you you keep that policy in place. And they may have requirements too, as to what kind of insurance you need to have, uh, what kind of limits, what kind of coverage you actually need. Um, as far as the short-term rental, I think Tony, you could have explained it better is going to talk to an agent who is, or a broker who is experienced in putting insurance on short-term rentals. So uh, where I have seen it is that, you know, you have your homeowner's insurance or maybe it is just an investment property for you. Um, it's not even a primary home or a second home. It's just an investment property where you go and get a landlord policy with almost like a short-term renter uh, rider agreement that's added on to your policy. That's you know an extra cost. Um, so that's one way I've seen it written up too. But highly recommend having some kind of coverage uh, for. Um, the LLCs, I don't have that umbrella coverage, but for anything that is in my personal name, um, I do have umbrella policies on those to go above and beyond any policy or any coverage that my, you know, regular homeowners insurance coverage may not cover. And yeah, you you hit the nail on the head. The reason why we did that is because the majority of our short-term rentals are titleless held in our personal name. So we needed that extra layer of protection because we don't have that LLC on title to kind of separate everything there. So it kind of makes us sleep a little bit easier at night with that additional umbrella. But have you ever actually had to like had a claim against any of your insurance policies at any of your properties? No, knock on wood. I have it. Yeah. Good thing I'm sitting yeah. at a wood table. Yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah, no, I have never had to make a claim. I did have to at the 40 unit apartment complex that I started out managing. We had severe water damage from an ice storm where ice built up on the roof and then the ice started to melt, but the, the water had nowhere to go but into the roof and into the eaves. And then it caused $100,000 worth of damage or um, I think it was maybe like eight apartments total that were all along this this wall. And it was an extensive project. We called like a home remediation company where they come in, they rip out the drywall, they dry out the, the basically you're down to the studs, they dry it out, and then they go back and rebuild the walls. And what we did was we had um, hired somebody, I can't think of what the name is, but it's some kind of It's not an insurance broker, but what he does is he'll come in and he'll 
try and get you more money from the insurance company. So like, you know, lost rents of if we have to put people to the hotel, like make sure that you're, you're getting the maximum benefit from your policy. And so the insurance company like originally offered to write a check for this to cover it. And we had him come in and actually get us more money from the insurance company. And then we had to pay him a percentage of what he got us over what we had originally got. So I can't think of what the, the, his job title was called. Um, but if you do find yourself in a situation where maybe your policy isn't, you know, going to be covering what you thought it was going to be, it may be worth hiring someone like this and giving them a cut because it's better to, you know, get a little bit more than no more at all. Ashley, what was the episode where we had um, the asset protection guy? I can't believe I don't know this offhand because I give it yeah, out all the all time. The time. I'll look real quick. Yeah, look it up. Real quick. And I'll share really quickly. So we actually haven't had any claims against uh, any of our insurance policies either. Thank God. But I, I always do get uh, somewhat nervous because obviously with the short-term rental space, we get people coming in and out and we have hot tubs at the majority of our properties. We have now an indoor pool at one of our properties and those by themselves are just like high risk things to have. Um, so we, yeah, I'm, I'm just always, always, uh, always nervous of those things. That's why we want to make sure that we're, we're really beefing it up. Um, did you find it? Yeah, it's episode 106. Uh, Brian Bradley, he's a, a asset protection attorney. So he did two episodes with us. So I think it was 105 and 106 or 106 and 107. Like it was just such a wealth of information. We had to break them up into to two episodes there. So if you want to be scared out of potentially ever buying your first uh, <laughs> long-term or, or short-term rental, then definitely listen to those episodes. All right. Well, we're, we feel like we, we got through a lot today already, right? Yeah. Yeah. This is good. Um, thank you guys so much for joining us for this week's Ricky Reply. My name is Ashley at Wealth Firm Rentals and he's Tony at Tony J. Robinson. And we will be back on Wednesday with a guest. Still.